Today, the president signed into law the by now famous FAA fix bill that grants the FAA special flexibility to deal with sequester cuts. And perhaps most importantly to, to those who voted on it, ends flight delays. And while the concerns of frequent flyers and commuting congressmen have been heard and addressed, millions of Americans are still being impacted by the cuts. A new poll released today by CBS and New York Times found that 27% of Americans say that sequester is personally affecting them somewhat or a great deal. That's a huge number of Americans whose lives are being directly impacted by the sequester, and we're only a month and a half into this thing. And when you scratch the surface of the latest polling a little bit, you start to see a very real, measurable difference in how people feel about the sequester, depending on how much money they make. 39% of Americans whose annual household income is over $100,000 a year say the sequester will hurt the economy. That's compared to 49% of people whose annual household income are less than $100,000 a year who stayed the same. This, this gulf in public opinion, which I think is just starting to grow based on personal wealth, is of course at the heart of why the first bill out of Congress to deal with the effects of the sequester was a frequent flyer bailout bill. And not a bill to prevent poor kids from getting kicked out of Head Start, or to make sure the elderly continue to get meals, or even a bill to ensure cancer patients can get their medications, which are subject to the Medicare cuts mandated by the sequester, and have since become so expensive to administer that cancer clinics around the country are turning Medicare patients away. So while Congress is in recess this week, the effects of their reckless decisions continue to beat down people around the country every single day, and they have a requirement to fix this thing. What the GOP wants is for people to accept the normalcy of a post-sequester world as the status quo, and we here refuse to do that. So, joining me tonight, Rose Gerber. She's a director at the Community Oncology Alliance and a cancer survivor herself. Rose, thank you for joining Hi, me. Hi, thank you, Chris. Um, so, you work, uh, you were a survivor yourself? Yes, I am. I'm actually a 10-year cancer survivor. In fact, uh, tomorrow I'm actually seeing my oncologist as part of my follow-up. And you work with folks um, that are going to these community oncology clinics, right? That's where they're getting their treatment. That's correct. And for the viewers who aren't familiar with what we mean when we say a community cancer care setting, these are the private practices within people's hometowns. So this is where the majority of cancer patients are treated. So we use the term community cancer care. So this is where the majority of people are treated. Yes. And in these cancer clinics, um, government, Medicare helps to pay for the cost of uh, chemotherapy drugs which are very expensive right correct very expensive and again it's you know we'll talk today and when people are reading about sequestration they'll focus on the economic terms and there is a reality and it's very hard especially for patients to accept that a cancer clinic is in fact a small business and when you're a cancer patient it never crossed my mind that somebody a practice administrator had to go and order your drugs so that they were kept in inventory and ready for you when you came in to be treated so this is uh, all part of the, the care setting. So the clinics, uh, they, they, they buy the drugs and then they, they sell them at a very small markup to, to patients. Correct. And that markup is what allows them to stay in business, essentially. And that's now being slashed by the cuts to Medicare that have been part of the sequester. Correct. And again, when you think about a cancer setting, you have your nurses and your doctors, and Congresswoman Elmers will be in in a few minutes to, to speak right. with you. And what we have to recognize is part of the care is the staff. It's the oncologists that take care of us. I have a very close relationship 10 years later with my doctor, Dr. Jagatham Paul. Uh, you know, it's a continuity of care, and the nurses, the doctors are there. That's part of, part of your treatment. And so what are you hearing from patients around the country about the effects of this cut where, where people are, are, are being told that these clinics can't offer the chemotherapy drugs given the, 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 the cut to the price of drugs they're getting from the government? Well, it's actually very heartbreaking because, again, we're, let's talk now. We've talked about the economics of it. Let's talk about the emotional part of it. So just today I spoke with two of our cancer center practice administrators and patient advocates from their practice. The, again, these are the people that run the practices and patients within the practices. So one of our practices, Northwest Georgia Oncology, they have 10 locations. 76 of their patients have now had to go uh, into other settings. So again, instead of being in their normal place with their normal physician and doctors. In the midst of chemo, let's yes, be clear. Yes, and that's very upsetting. And one thing, again, I mentioned I'm a tenure survivor. I can remember what it felt like, like it was yesterday. You are so vulnerable. You're so upset. You're, it's the worst time of your life. No matter what you're portraying, on the outside your heart is breaking you could be a single parent you can be in this case we're talking about a Medicare age population right. wherever you're at 
it is one of the most unsettling times in life. But if you have that care, you have a doctor or a nurse that cares about you, and now that's disrupted, and you have to go somewhere else. And not only go somewhere else, let's really think about what this means. You know, we have, I had spoke to another practice administrator in Salt Lake City. She has an 82-year-old patient, a lymphoma survivor, who now has to travel 62, 62 miles. Now, for perspective, what this means, I, when I was diagnosed, I was 39 years old. Right. My treatment center, uh, Eastern Connecticut Hematology and Oncology in Southeastern Connecticut, was less than 30 miles from my house. I'm not ashamed to admit this. My husband drove me to every appointment because that, that 30 miles seemed like 300 miles yeah. because of my emotional state of mind. Now our seniors, the most vulnerable... Talking about an 82-year-old woman yes. who's going to have to get herself 62 miles. Right. And we're, taking, we're taking people in the midst of chemo. We're, we're tearing up the relationship they have in the midst of this treatment. We are pushing them out of these clinics, often into hospitals, which all the studies tell us are cost more. So right. it's not even sound policy. Right. So this is what things look like on the ground. And Rose Gerber, thank you so much for coming in and laying this out for us and, and, and bringing us some on-the-ground perspective. It's really, really uh, helpful. Thank you. Thank you.